Well, good morning, Calvary family. Great to have you with us on this Father's Day. I want to welcome you. My name is Pastor John Dainsburg. I'm one of the pastors here. And today we are going to talk about um, our greatest lasting legacy. But before we do that, let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Uh, thank you that we get to celebrate Father's Day. We know that that brings up all kinds of emotions for, for folks from missing their dads to, to um, just maybe some who um, had a great relationship with their father, maybe those that had quite the opposite. Lord, I pray that you'd help us to remember that you are the ultimate father. Uh, we're told in Scripture to honor our father and mother, and that doesn't mean that we always honor the things that they did, but we honor the position, we honor the title, we honor that you have placed them in our lives. Um, we're here because of them. So, Lord, I want to thank you for um, the good fathers that um, have impacted my life specifically. I want to thank you for the mentors, and I want to thank you here at Calvary that you have graciously given us um, several great fathers. Not perfect fathers. None of us are perfect. We have one perfect father, and that's you. But just uh, for the godly men that you have placed here, I want to thank you for them. Lord, I pray that you'd bless them, that you'd equip them, that you'd encourage them, and that you would empower them. Help them to reflect you well to those around them. And I pray the same thing for myself. Help, help all of us to reflect you well. And I ask these things now in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, today I'm going to start out talking about a, a, a treasure. And then we're going to talk about a command. And then finally, a privilege. First of all, a treasure. If you see on the screen behind me, that is uh, northern Iowa. And I have a couple of uh, dear friends, Dick and Linda Mansky, and some of you know them from church here. And they were gracious enough, Dick was gracious enough to invite me down early May to do some uh, hunting and fishing with him, which was a lot of fun. But one of the things that was kind of special about that, I really love outdoor things. I love conservation efforts. And he was able to show me and bring me around to see different projects that he's been part of for decades. And just as you will see in a, a desert, an oasis draws life in a desert. Of the farmland of northern Iowa, where you have fields everywhere, where you have uh, farmers that have taken special care to work on conservation, whether it be tree rows, planting um, certain, certain crops or, or, or grains, um, not just food plots, but, but natural grasses and things like that, which are great nesting habitat for birds and, and critters, but also uh, uh, digging ponds and, and draining um, water in such a way that benefits wildlife. It's, it's really a cool thing. And Dick, Dick has kind of set a standard for that. So one of, one of the friends that he partners with down there, and they work together on some of these projects, was bringing me to his property one day and showing me, and I said, man, this is amazing property. How did you get this property? He said, well, it's kind of a crazy story. He says, I was pheasant hunting with some guys, and I was walking this ditch, and I saw this sign tipped over in the ditch, and here it was a realtor's sign that somehow the wind or something had blown it over. He said, I saw that sign, and he said, I dropped everything. I said, hey, guys, got to go. He went into town. He called the realtor. He called his bank and got the process going because he saw the treasure and the potential of this land and he wanted that, and he was willing to drop everything to get her done. Well, in Matthew chapter 13, we have a similar story, a parable from Jesus. And Jesus in Matthew 13 is talking about kingdom, prince, uh, kingdom uh, he's given ki kingdom illustrations. He says in, in verse 44, he says, The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure that a man discovered hidden in a field, and in his excitement, he hid it again and sold everything he owned to get enough money to buy the field. Now, this little parable, this little story might not mean a lot to us, but in the Middle East, specifically in the Holy Land in Israel, Israel is kind of a linchpin country between three continents, and there were armies going back and forth all the time. In ancient days, of course, there were no safety deposit box, there were no banks that you could safely um, put your resources, so they quite often would bury those resources. 
And then if they needed something, they'd go and bury it, and then they'd bury it again. Well, what happens if you buried a uh, resource, and then you got taken as a, you were killed, <laughs> or you were taken as a prisoner, or you were a slave and, and taken away? That treasure is lost. Well, here's an illustration, and I'm not going to unpack this, this treasure. There's, there's many things we could talk about specifically about uh, this treasure. I want you to know this, just in context, that as far as our salvation is concerned, which is the greatest treasure, it is the greatest treasure, uh, we don't buy it, we don't earn it, we don't deserve it. It's all a gift. It's a gift of grace. But from a personal perspective, is there anything more valuable than the personal relationship you have with Christ? And my answer is no. There is nothing more valuable. So it is the treasure. It is my treasure. I mean, I look at the most, most valuable thing that I have. It's Jesus. It's what Jesus has done for me. Jared preached a couple of weeks ago um, in the first uh, couple chapters of Ephesians in his series in Ephesians, and he mentioned many of these things. And if you didn't get to watch those services, I want to encourage you to go back and watch those. But in Christ, we are loved, we are accepted, we are declared righteous. In Christ, we are not condemned. These are all what the scriptures say. We're set free from the power of sin and death. We're made holy or right before God. We are adopted as sons and daughters of, of our, our Lord and King. We're given new life. We're forgiven. We're empowered by the Holy Spirit. We're blessed with every spiritual blessing. We're given an inheritance and an eternal life. And I could go on and on about each one of those things because they're so amazing. The treasure that we have in Christ. Well, the second thing I want to talk about is a command. We have this treasure but we have a command, and the command is to disciple our children. If you are a parent, if you are a grandparent, if you are a father, we are specifically in Scripture told to be disciplers and disciplers of our children. Um, what is the greatest legacy? Um, if you, when you die, um, people are going to say some things about you, what the Bible says, your greatest legacy is this, that you would raise a godly family and that you would faithfully serve um, Jesus. That's it. Raise a godly family, faithfully serve Jesus. And you say, well, what about all the other things? Well, here's the other things. If you're, if you're doing the other things while you raise a godly family and faithfully serve Jesus, thumbs up. But those are the priority according to Scripture. Now, we can decide whether we want to do it Scripture's way or not, and that's for you to decide because ultimately someday I will answer before the Lord how I handled this with my family and my life, and you will do the same. You will stand before the Lord. If you are a Christian, you will stand before the Lord not in judgment, not in condemnation, but you will still stand before the Lord and give an account. So what did you do with your family? How did you pass on the legacy, this treasure that you've been given by grace? So Ephesians 6, verse 4, I just want to read verse 4, and that is, Fathers, fathers, do not provoke your children to anger by the way you treat them. And I could say a lot about that, but that's not today's message. Rather, once again, there's fathers, bring them up, who? Your children, bring them up with the discipline and instruction that comes from the Lord. That's what we're to do, disciple our children. If we go to the Old Testament, uh, we could read a similar passage out of Deuteronomy chapter 6, 1 through 9. These are the commands and decrees and regulations that the Lord your God commanded me to teach you. You must obey them in the land that you are about to occupy. This is Moses saying this right before the children of Israel. They've been wandering in the desert for 40 years. Moses is passing the baton to Joshua, and he's giving this, Moses is giving these commands to the people. He says, and you and your children and grandchildren must fear the Lord your God as long as you live. If you obey all his decrees and commands, you will enjoy a long life. 
Listen closely, Israel, and be careful. Then all will go well with you, and you will have many children in the land flowing with milk and honey, just as the Lord, the God of your ancestors, promised you. Listen, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. You know, in our culture today, we have many things that people are chasing after, some of those things that we would call idols, some of those things that we would call gods with a small g or a lords as a small l. But there is one God. There is one Lord. The Bible talks about him, and that is the one who the treasure is all about. So he says, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone, and you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your strength. A companion passage, Jesus was being, trying to, he was talking to religious leaders, Matthew 22, they were trying to trip him up. They said, hey, Lord, what's the greatest commandment? He said, to love the Lord your God with all your soul, um, all your heart, all your soul, all your strength, and all your mind. That's what Jesus said. It's a companion compass, uh, passage to what we read here in Deuteronomy. He says, and you must commit yourselves wholeheartedly to these commands that I'm giving you today. Repeat them again and again to your children. Talk about them when you're at home, when you're on the road, when you're going to bed, when you're getting up. Tie them to your hands and wear them on your forehead as reminders. Write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. You know, there's a passage in Scripture that talks about prayer and that we're to pray without ceasing. That doesn't mean that we're on our hands and knees all day long praying, although that's not wrong, that's not bad. It means that we're in constant conversation with the Lord. We're constantly talking to him because we're in relationship with him. The same is true here with our children. We are in relationship with our children, and every, uh, everything that happens in life is an opportunity. It's a privilege, a privilege for us to take the truth of Scripture, the Word of God, and to apply it to every situation of life, good and bad. Because the scripture, the lens of scripture, speaks into everything. There is nothing that scripture doesn't speak into. So it's our privilege, it's our opportunity then to share that. So what is a, a goal, a Christian parenting goal? Here's a suggestion. For my child, grandchild to become a follower and lifelong disciple of Jesus Christ. What we're talking about Christian families, Christian parents, Christian fathers, Christian grandparents. We're talking about spiritual transformation, discipleship. That is your job. It is not to be farmed off to the church. We don't subcontract to the Christian camp. We don't subcontract to the youth group. We don't subcontract to the youth leader or the youth volunteers. It is our job. Parents, fathers, disciple your children. It is your job. It's your responsibility. You will answer before the Lord for that. You will. Now, the church is to help. Christian camp is to help. But you, your job. You don't farm it out. You don't sub it out. If a church is, is not tithing, you know, it, the church doesn't begin a program to start tithing for people. No. What the church should do is teach the people about tithing and the principles of tithing and then expect the people to live out in obedience what God's word says. Same is true when it comes to parenting. Okay, my child, grandchild, become a follower and lifeline disciple of Jesus Christ whose priority is to love the Lord with all their heart, soul, and mind, whose focus is to pass on their faith to future generations. That's something to consider, and it's biblical. <laughs> but there'll be pushback. Uh, if you do that, there will be pushback. Uh, if you have young children at home, there'll be less pushback. Start early when they're young and incorporate spiritual truths, spiritual values into your parenting, into your home. If you have older children and this is going to be new for them, you start slow but you intentionally make incremental changes. You might say, but I'm ill-equipped. Well, we're going to talk about that in a little bit, so don't worry about that one. You say, I have no time. That's not a good excuse because you do have time for things that are important to you. I know that's true because it's true for all of us. We make time for things that are important to us. 
How about indoctrination? Well, I don't want to indoctrinate my kids. Hey, your kids are being indoctrinated everywhere they go. They are saturated in a world of indoctrination. And I could make, I don't have time to talk about it right here, but I could make an argument that if you are following Scripture and critically looking at Scripture with your children, you're, you, you are doing something because you are looking critically. You are doing something the culture is not doing. Um, you say, well, it's going to be costly. There's a personal cost. There's a, there's a sacrifice. Yeah, there is. But there is, too, if you are overweight and you need to lose weight, there's a cost and sacrifice. If you have debt, there's a cost and sacrifice um, to, to get out of debt. You might say, well, it's inconvenient. Well, a lot of things are inconvenient. Changing your baby's diaper is inconvenient. Helping your child when your child's sick is inconvenient, but you do it. How about uh, in our culture today, you might be, you might be um, canceled. It's a difficult time to be a parent. I just say that right now. Um, it was much easier. My kids are adults. It was much easier to be a parent years ago than it is today. Parents, you got a tough job, but you got a big God. You got a big Lord. He's for you. So, so that's another pushback. And then for those that think, oh, but if I do this, my child might be put on a put on an island. They might be isolated. They might miss out on opportunities. What is the greatest opportunity for your child to have? It's that treasure. That's what you don't want him to miss out on. You don't want him to miss out on the treasure. You don't want him to miss out on living a life for the Lord because that's eternal. That'll last forever. The things on earth here will not. So what is your child's biggest obstacle? If your child's biggest obstacle or asset, could work either way, is me. It's you. If you looked in the mirror, you are the biggest asset or you are the biggest obstacle for your children. Well, two pictures of, of parenting as we land the plane here. One is of uh, a travel agent and one is a tour guide. What does a travel agent do? A travel agent will take you and talk about some exotic place. It'll get out all the flashy, shiny brochures, exciting places to see, all this sort of thing. But they're not going on the trip. They're not taking you on the journey. Where a tour guide takes you there, answers your questions, shows you, guides you, walks with you, as a parent, a Christian parent, you are to be a tour guide. You are, to, you are to not only talk about these wonderful things, but you're to show them. You're to live life with them. You have the privilege, and this is such a privilege. You have the privilege to take this young child, this young baby, and throughout a lifetime to guide, to nurture, to love, to instruct that young child in the way of the Lord. Well, there are no perfect parents. And like I said, it's harder to be a parent today than it's ever been. But I want to encourage you as, as parents, a couple of things. Um, number one, and this goes back a long time ago, whether you're at Promise Keepers conferences, if you're a, someone that went to Promise Keepers, you might have heard Josh McDowell say, uh, rules without relationship." equals rebellion. You know, build a relationship with your children. Make sure your home is a place that is, is loving and accepting, uh, supportive, that your home is grace-filled. I want to have a grace-filled home. Let's face it, we all need grace, right? Well, your kids need grace as well. Build a home that is loving, accepting, supportive, and gracious. Dennis Rainey said years ago, too, talking about a bridge, he said, um, looking at parenting and this relationship thing as a bridge, he says, if you, if you keep that bridge of relationship up and you work on that and you keep that strong, 
He says, you can, you can drive a, a truckload of truth over that bridge. But you've got to maintain that bridge. You've got to maintain that relationship with your kids. But if the bridge goes out, well, now we've got problems. So I want to say this as we close. At Calvary, we're all about discipleship. But we are way, way, big, big, big on discipling our kids. And none of us, like I say, none of us are perfect parents. And some of us might feel, man, ill-equipped or just inadequate in the job. And if you feel inadequate as a parent, uh, I will say join the club. Because it, it is overwhelming at times. But we have resources here. Churches design resources not only to help you and support you. You are the discipler. It is your job. But we want to help equip you. We want to help encourage you. We want to help support you. So one of the things we're doing is we have uh, family nights, and that's coming up uh, on uh, the 14th of July, I believe it is, at 6 o'clock. And that just gives a family an opportunity to come, have a, a simple meal together, a lesson, some crafts, have some fun together, a couple hours. That's one thing that, that we're doing here throughout the summer. But we also have wonderful resources, in fact, thousands of resources when it comes to parenting through something called Right Now Media. And if you are not connected to Right Now Media through the church here, we want to help you to do that. So there are ways that you can do that. We'll put that on the screen, direct you to our website, how you can connect with Right Now Media. But Right Now Media has literally uh, hundreds of parenting uh, video, uh, curriculums, tips, short little clips, things that would be so encouraging for you. And let's face it, we need that encouragement. We need that instruction. And it's biblically based. So that's something that we'd like to provide for you. Well, I hope that as a family that your goal is to raise godly kids. And as a father, I hope that your goal is to have a godly family, that you are um, pouring that into your wife if, you're, if you are uh, not a single parent, but you're pouring that into your, your, your kids and family as well. And being willing to be vulnerable with them be willing to say, you know what, I blew it, I'm sorry. Take your son and daughter and say, you know what, daddy shouldn't have done that. Daddy shouldn't have said that. You know, our kids need to see that we're real. And then as a family that we faithfully serve Christ, we faithfully serve Jesus. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this time. Thank you for your great word. Uh, thank you for the treasure that we have in Jesus. And I, Lord, I thank you for the command too the command that we are to share this and pass this on. It's, it's to be part of our life every single day as we, as we relate to one another in family, whether it's with our, our spouses or it's with our children or grandchildren. Everything uh, is centered around you because you are the great treasure. And what a great privilege that is for us as parents. Lord, I pray that we would see the beauty and the blessing of that. Because there's coming a day when all the things of this world that people think are so important will pass away. But the things that are done for Christ, the people we loved, and the people that we pointed to Jesus, and the things we did for Jesus will last forever. So we just thank you for this, and we pray that you would um, bless um, your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's continue to worship.